Hello and welcome to The Better Part. I am Phil Lenahan, your host for today's show. This is a show about wood and an artist. I like wood. I like wooden boats. I like wooden cooking utensils, totem poles, recycled woods, all wood things. Wood was once alive and maybe it's still alive when it's made into something beautiful. So stay tuned for our story about wood and an artist. Our guest today is Joey Coclus. He is from Moraga and Berkeley. He's currently from Santa Cruz. He went to Chico State and earned a bachelor's degree in physical geography and GIS. He's 28 years old. He started woodworking as a freshman in high school and didn't really keep in touch with that for many years. He got back into woodworking when he saw some dead trees up on some family property and um, he decided to mill them and possibly make some picnic tables. Well, he went and Googled Madrone tables, dining tables, and he saw the price and that they were charging for these things. And ka -ching, he changed his course. The apprenticeship he had lasted three or four days a week for about six months. He is now in his own business in a studio shop in Santa Cruz. His business card lists him as a log rescuer. This year, he was finally applied to the Santa Cruz Open Studios and was accepted. Congratulations and welcome, Joey. Thank you. Thank you for having me on this program. Just how, how did you d decide to start a career in wood? So I got into woodworking because my family has property up in the Santa Cruz Mountains and we had a stand of redwood trees die up there and I thought that I should probably mill them into lumber. And it seemed like I could just make picnic tables out of them. But then I uh, noticed that we also had madrone trees, other types of trees on the property that were interesting but I didn't know that people really milled them into lumber or made anything out of them. And I googled Madrone dining table mm -hmm. and saw the prices on those and was sort of hoodwinked into thinking that there was any money in it. <laughs> now, when I was down at your shop, there was there's a lot of other woodworking shops there. Th are they doing furniture and stuff like you're doing? Yeah. Um, my next door neighbor is doing what I'm doing. Somebody kitty corner to my shop is doing what I'm doing. Uh, the difference is that they're not also milling the lumber and making furniture. They're mainly just furniture makers. Where did they get their lumber from you? From some of your slabs or what? Sometimes. That's more rare, but there's other sawyers um, in the Santa Cruz area who they get their wood from. They also get it um, from just local hardwood carriers. Uh, describe your training and your internship or yeah, yeah I guess an intern. Yeah, so <laughs> I did an apprenticeship with a local furniture maker and I had started in high school with just, you know, first year, um, you know, freshman year wood shop where I had learned how to use the power tools but not to the point where I could really make a finished piece. So I emailed um, somebody who I found by just Googling Santa Cruz Woodworker and I liked his work. So I emailed him and asked if he wanted an apprentice and he did. So I went to work for him for free for about six months. Oh, we um, covered a little bit in, in the slideshow about you actually don't go down to Home Depot and get your wood, that you go out and find it yourself. Descri yeah. <laughs> describe, describe your career as a log rescuer. Yeah, so I have contacted several tree services asking for their logs and in some cases um, they'll actually get back to me and I'll get logs from them but usually they just ignore me but <laughs> I also run a Craigslist ad that says uh, large madrone trees wanted large walnut trees wanted things of that nature so if people have trees fall down on their property I come out and mill it on site 
Well, speaking of rescuing logs, let's look at some slides that I have taken when I went up with you in the Santa Cruz Mountains to log a great big madrone log. So let's see that now. Okay. Well, here we are up in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and Joey, you dragged me up to show me this great big enormous log. There must be a story behind this. Yeah, so I rent a shop that I am in with my friend Tom, who is another woodworker. And this madrone tree was dying in front of the house that he lives in, up in Ben Lomond. And he called me up and said that they had to take the tree down and that he was wondering if it was big enough to bother to saw into lumber. So I said yes, because it looked like it was large enough. So would this be a normal uh, tree rescue or log rescue that you were involved in? Yeah, yeah. I actually have uh, a Craigslist ad up in the, <laughs> in the Santa Cruz area asking for people's trees that have to come down or trees that fell on people's property. Okay, well, this, this log is, is pretty thick from, from this end. About f how much does this thing weigh? Um, I would guess between 1,000 and 1,500 pounds. Of you, but you're moving them with these great big lever things just yeah. to roll it in the right direction? Yeah, it's called a PV, so a it has a, a hook and it's a big leverage bar that allows you to roll it more easily. Okay, so uh, next thing we're going to see here is this enormous saw. Uh, explain a little bit about it. It's, uh, how wide is it? Um, the one that I brought for this particular log, uh, the bar allows you to cut up to a 36 inch wide log. Um, but I, I do have another bar that goes up to 64 inches. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a chainsaw mill, and uh, it has a special ripping chain. And the one that I brought for this log in particular um, has a bar that allows you to mill up to 36 inch wide logs. But I have another bar that's 72 inches long, and after all of the um, after the rig is clamped to it, it allows you to cut up to 64 inches. Then that would basically be the width of, width of a table and you wouldn't have to laminate anything together. Yeah, and in fact, it's much larger than most of my tables. <laughs> okay, uh, so the first thing you do with this log is you're now attaching a ladder to it. Why, why are you nailing or screwing this ladder down? So the ladder acts as a straight guide so the idea is that you attach the ladder to the log with screws so that it can't move around and that the parallel to the top of the ladder, um, and I have holes in the rungs which allow you to screw through them to attach to the log. And that's because the, obviously the roundness of the log wouldn't allow you to have anything stable on top of it unless you created it with the ladder. Exactly. Right, okay. So then the first cut is made with the ladder, uh, screwed onto it, and there you are slicing off the bark, the first one, right? Yeah, so the first cut, you're just trying to get a flat surface um, so that every cut thereafter is also flat. So I never actually have to attach the ladder to the log again after that. Yeah, we can see that. You just placed it on the top and you start cutting. So now we have a little video going on here of you cutting the log. Now that looks like a lot of work. The uh, little video I think is 60 seconds, but how long did it actually take to cut the, that slab on the log? Uh, that one actually took six minutes. Which six minutes. Yeah, so six, that's well. actually kind of on the shorter side because that log wasn't a very wide log. I've had cuts take up to a half an hour. Wow, and you need actually need two people. Yeah, um, the reason for that is that somebody has to be on the opposing side. So if I'm on the side with the power head pulling the trigger, um, I'm gonna be constantly pushing down and the power head is also pushing down, keeping the guide rails on the ladder. So somebody needs to be on the other side also pushing it forward but also pushing the guide rails onto the ladder, otherwise it will start to lift and then your cut isn't straight anymore. Oh, I see you're creating a lot of sawdust. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on okay. That. Here, here is after we make you made that cut. You're lifting off the uh, the slab, the first real slab, because the first one was the bark. So that is a really a nice piece. Uh, remember the little kid came out and said look, they look like gigantic pieces of bacon? Yeah, <laughs> they and they wanted to uh, use all the sawdust for their, uh, their garden. Yes, but you can't use all sawdust, right? There's one tree sawdust you can't use in your garden. You remember yeah, what that is? Yeah, walnut. Walnut. And Walnut's that's toxic, yeah. Toxic to plants. Okay, so there is a piece of bacon, gigantic bacon leaning up against it. And then here's a few shots of the grain. You said the grain will change slightly in processing. Did you say it, it fades a little bit and then comes back up when you finish it? Yeah, um, it'll basically turn orange when it is exposed to oxygen. Um, but then when you actually go back and plane it or take off the you know, top 64th of an inch or so, what, what is under that is typically much lighter. Uh -huh. And then it takes a few years to darken again. And there's the. Now, if you cut it, uh, it has to sit someplace, right? Yeah. So. And what is this a picture of? Uh, this is one of my air drying stacks. So, this is actually just outside of my wood shop in a little alleyway. <coughs> How long do they, do they stay there? Uh, they'll stay there for about one year per inch of thickness of the lumber, and uh, after that point, they'll actually have to be kiln dried. And looking at the next slide, we see the kiln dryer. Um, but that must tie up a lot of capital in winterizing all that wood, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cost of doing business. So we do have one finishing shot here, which we're going to look at. That's you at um, 60 miles an hour planing the top of a table. Now, yeah. uh, we have a great big plane here that you use. My, my question is, when you're planing a flat surface like that, why doesn't it leave any cut marks on the blade? Um, it would have to be extremely sharp not to leave a cut mark, mm -hmm. and also to have very little blade exposure. So you don't want the blade to be sticking out very far and you want to make sure that it's extremely sharp. So that way you're taking off very minimal shavings, which tend not to tear out the wood. Okay. So now we have a picture in the, uh, in the shop, which I call correcting flatness. You told me that that table, the wood came out and it's not flat. Yeah, so that was a slab that was brought to me beforehand. It was uh -huh. not one that I had milled. Uh -huh. And it had been sitting in somebody's garage for about 20 years, and it had cupped a little bit. So in order to get the cup out, I had to use a bunch of um, pieces of uh, half-inch thick by three-inch metal and clamp them to the, the slab to get it flat. And then eventually I made a base that was very, very stable and held it in place Although this is not the same table, basically it will turn out like this, right? Yeah. And then you, the uh, frame, this looks like a metal frame, uh, just keeps it flat also from yeah. the fastening. Okay? Just here's a little sample of the grain. You just uh, put some uh, acetone or something on the wood just to bring up the grain. You can see the beautiful grain starting there. Yeah. And this is a good example of what I was talking about earlier where um, Madrone wood turns out much lighter after it has cured. And last but not least, here's your office. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> office, uh, very messy office, full of dust, <laughs> and then, full of tools. <laughs> and then actually, this is one of the finished products, and um, it's pretty beautiful. Thanks. Okay, so let's go back to our program. Okay. Well, that looks like a lot of work. Um, yeah. Now, this is after you've been doing this for a while. How did you mill the trees on your family's property? You didn't know any of that type, that great big saw, did you then? No, but I did start out by getting a sort of cheaper bandsaw mill. So that was, that was the first type of mill that I had, but it's 
less portable than the chainsaw mill. So you would set it up and it cuts it this way, pushing the log through it? Uh, no, it's, um, it's kind of like you put the log in the middle of basically railroad tracks and push the mill <laughs> down it and it's on a carriage. Um, do you get recycled wood from different uh, buildings and stuff? No, I don't actually do that sort of thing. <laughs> oh, I put, I put it in the script here thinking it was, would be part of the program. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so describe going into business on your own. Oh, it's been really hard. <laughs> <laughs> Start from the beginning. So yeah. you, you, ha you work for this um, woodworker and he's teaching you a trade. Yeah. And you said you were making some of your stuff on the side there. Yeah. So, so then what do you do next to start your business? So uh, it really started with uh, posting pictures of what I was making on things like Facebook. And I fortunately had a cousin who really liked what I was doing. And they decided to commission a coffee table. And I sort of decided that I should you know, keep going at that point. Uh, I also contacted furniture stores and asked them about putting pieces in that they would sell on a consignment basis. So when did you get your property to put in that beautiful shop we just saw? Oh, uh, that was about a year and a half ago. So that would be about two years after I actually started making furniture. Where did you make the furniture before you had a shop? Uh, in my garage. <laughs> Which is yeah, pretty small. In, in the little house down in Santa Cruz? Yeah. Oh, I'm familiar with that little house. Okay, so then what happened next? Um, so I tried working out of there, but I had a feeling that I was going to eventually get shut down because of all the noise that I was making. So I moved my uh, mm -hmm. operation to a shipping crate in a commercial area. And that was pretty cramped because it's only about eight feet wide. So <laughs> I had to deal with 8 feet by 8 feet by 40 feet. And um, that, that was hard, but I was making it work. And then finally, uh, my friend who is in the building where I now have my shop called me and said that a space was becoming available there. So you share it with somebody else I was in the shop. And yeah, I share it with uh, two other people, one of whom is the guy whose house that madrone tree came oh, from. Oh, that was his house? Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, <coughs> well, talking about your shop, what, what are the facilities in your shop that you have? That, yeah. That big oven? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I have actually put that outside since that oh, picture was taken. Oh, outside? Yeah, but uh, so I also have a 25-inch wide belt sander, which is really useful. I just got a 24 inch wide planer and that thing takes off tons of wood at a time so that's great for planing large pieces of wood. Uh, we have table saws, band saw, a big joiner for flattening wood. Um, and a lot of clamps. Lots of clamps. <laughs> Not enough though. <laughs> Never enough clamps. Never enough clamps. <laughs> All right. you. Um, mentioned that you've been uh, approved for the uh, Santa Cruz Studio Tour, is it called? Yeah, the Open Studios. Yeah, so you make most of your stuff on consignment. So uh, what, what or on commission at this point. Yes, but ha what are you go you're going to gather some of your pieces to show? You're going to call up customers and say, I want the piece back for a show? No, I'm going to use <laughs> um, a couple of bar stools that I have made and a chair uh, but I'm not going to bring a bunch of stuff back because even if I could get it back, there's no room for it. You're going to have at least one table? Yeah. Um, I'll be working on several pieces, which is also good because that allows people to see more of the process. Well, now that you're a wood entrepreneur, um, what, what were your challenges? What do you see the challenges for this? Um, definitely getting more clientele. Um, it's always hard just like letting people know you exist, I feel is the biggest challenge. <laughs> well, um, it was an interesting, I saw I, Andrew in pictures, I don't think it was in the shop. You made a table that has a big crack in it. Yeah. And you put 
butterfly joints in it. And yeah. It's, it, people like to buy crack tables. Yeah, so <laughs> it, you know, it, it allows you to add some artistry to it. I often will fill the cracks with epoxy and then put the butterfly or uh, bow, bow tie joint in. So then the uh, crack is filled in with something and everything is flat. Yeah. Okay, what about casework? I looked up casework and it said building boxes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's very much what it is. So you try to build boxes that are very square and, you know, try to face everything with the most beautiful wood that you can, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, always depends on what somebody's budget is, is how, how beautiful you can go. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to show a picture of a cabinet because it's, it's labor intensive from that point of view, building all the boxes and all the, all the drawers yeah. and everything and then matching the wood. And, uh, yeah. All right. Um, so far, what was your best piece of work? Um, probably the cabinet that you're going to show. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Uh, it looks like a, a, a really hard thing. When I do stuff like that. The Nothing ever comes out in right angles. Yeah. And so then you put the drawer in and it stays in. And it's not useful as a drawer. So um, you're a young man that started into business. And um, what would you advise other people? Oh, mm -hmm. I'd almost say don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Just <Well>. don't. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's what most people say. There's an easy path out getting a, a job with a GPS company. You yeah. Up, yeah. <laughs> and you decided to become an artist. Well, we're pretty much out of time. I can't think of anything else. Do you think this will be a life's work as an artist? I hope so. I mean, I'd like to do some other things with my life as well, but I'd like to always be doing woodworking at some level. What about um, wood carving? Is that a whole different field? Statues and uh, ornamental things, that's a different field, right? Yeah, I haven't dabbled in that at all. But I would like to do more uh, wood turning or making bowls. Ah. So Seems that like a lot of people make bowls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I haven't gotten into it particularly because I don't think that there's really any money in it at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of um, bowls get made, but I don't think a lot of a beautiful tables like the ones you make get made. Oh, thanks. Well, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks thank you. you for driving from Santa Cruz in the middle of the rush hour. Yeah. <laughs> and we wish you the best of luck in your furniture making or that furniture making doesn't seem the right term making artistic furniture I oh, guess thanks. is what I would like <laughs> to say thanks again yeah thank you for having me thank you for watching us today we're the better part we're volunteers at the Cupertino Senior Center that makes very nice television programs if you'd like to be part of our club call the Cupertino Senior Center and come down and visit us our programs are available on YouTube and Roku, and um, join us or watch us or see us next week. Bye now.